Um, so it's quite different to a lot of the talks I had this morning, which have been about looking at the stones themselves and the stones relationships. So I'm going into more of the methodology of how I look at stones and how I try to understand their stories. Um, I'm just heading to the third year of my PhD, so I'm now allegedly writing all this up. Um, so I've been collecting data from quite a lot of places, and I'll go into some of them that I do today. Um, so I wanted to address, first of all, sort of why this session and why I look at stone in particular. And um, this hand axe is uh, it's owned by the author Alan Garner. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with his work. He's like a young adult, adult fiction writer. He writes a lot of like folk and um, lots about landscapes. Um, he's very influenced by archaeology and um, he talks about this hand axe in a book he wrote with an archaeologist called Mark Edmonds about how stones like this, they want to be held, they want to be touched, they influence language, they influence how people interact with not only the stone itself but with other people and with the land in general. And uh, basically it's an excellent book and I'd recommend it to all of you. Um, and from the abstract we talked about how Stone is seen in sort of ways that it's immovable, it's permanent, it's, it's long-lasting, resilient. But it's also, it's, it's changeable, it's malleable, it's chameleonic. It changes with how light is on it, it changes with how wet it is, it changes with whoever's holding it or using it. So it's both things at once, it's unchangeable and it's changeable. And I think that makes it very valuable for understanding past societies. Um, and the facet that I in particular am looking at is the different colour of stone and in particular Neolithic monuments in Atlantic Europe. Um, so this is an example from Anglesey, uh, which is one of the first areas that I studied. Um, so this is the type of monument I'm looking at, Neolithic monuments, funerary monuments, um, things like passage graves. But I also look at things like standing stones on their own, stone circles. Um, and the regions that I've looked at so far, so I've done Anglesey up in North Wales, Pembrokeshire in the south. Um, Wessex are the area that um, Katie was talking about, so the Avery and Stonehenge lang landscape with the sarsens and the bluestones there. Um, I've been here in the Netherlands this year in the Drenthe region, um, up in Moon in Denmark, and then in Sarsjöping in Sweden. Um, and sort of a range of monument types, and largely passage graves, which tend to be the ones that have survived and they tend to be the ones that get the most attention, um, and the ones that have got the most stones for me to look at, basically. And what I do is, instead of just going there and writing this is the colour I think the stone is. I use this little device um, and it's built from our Arduino board. It's got a little sensor and it's got its own light source. So it's always a constant light source I use when I look at the stones. This is at Stonehenge. Um, and it gives me an RGB reading of what it thinks that colour that stone is. Um, and then I combine that with more personal experiences. So this is an example of what I did at um, Brinkhead this year, which is a place in Anglesey. And I get people, other people, not just me, to go into the site and say, well, what are you perceiving? What colours are you looking at? So I try to have a bit of the digital, a bit of the analogue, a little bit of both going on at the same time. Um, and to sort of illustrate that in a bit more depth, I've chosen to look at um, Brinkethithi, which is a passage grave on Anglesey. It's a place I've got quite a long-standing relationship. I used to go play there when I was a kid because I've got family on Anglesey. Um, it's one of the most well-known and sort of best preserved sites um, on the island. It's very easy to access, it's open all year round, there's a nice car park of the almost processional way leading up to it from there now. Um, and you can go in at any time and have a look in there, it's always very open. So when you go there's often lots of tourists. Um, I record like audio recording of my experience when I'm on site to refer back to later. And when I very first went there my device was in a wooden box and you can hear me swearing when a dog tries to eat it. <laughs> uh, and there it is inside the chamber there. Um, it's quite an interesting site because the of the other sats, uprights and capstones are probably in the same place originally where it was extensively excavated in the 1920s and it had been quite denuded and that the mound was gone and it was a bit trashed really so it has been reconstructed uh, and very handily a lot of the stones that were put in as reconstructed stones have got little holes drilled in them where hemp the archaeologist did it denoted where he messed around with it basically by showing you the stones so I can probably say that the stone's roughly in the right place. And it's made largely of a stone called blue schist, which is a natural um, stone of the area. that It sits on a seam of it on Anglesey. Um, and it varies in colours from very, very deep blue, almost black, uh, right to very, very pale grey. So it's lots of varying colours in there. Um, and there's some really like, interesting folklore associated with this site. There's a pillar within the back, right at the back of the chamber. You can't quite see this photo here. And there's this great local folk that it's a, it's a vitrified tree trunk that's like standing like a guardian in the chamber. It's not, it is blue schist. Um, but every time I visit that site and there's somebody visits, they say, oh, do you know this, this is a tree in, in this chamber? And I'm like, it's 
it's not a tree, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I do love this. Like, it's like persisting through, through time, this little story, which is wonderful. Um, and so I go there a lot to do, um, to take my own readings, but also to like, take part in public events because I have very big public open days here. Um, so this is the first site that I looked at digitally. Um, I used my colour sensor and took average readings of all the stones. And this is what it comes out with. So this is what I do with all my sites. Um, I make sort of an illustration so I can very immediately look at it and go, oh, they've used this colour in this part, they've used this colour here. <clears throat> it's just like a very immediate, obvious thing I can look at. Um, but then also I have then a huge database of these readings uh, and I link them with geographical locations. So I can then do some analysis and say, where, where is redstone used predominantly in a site? Where is, you know, like very pale stones used as capstones, this kind of thing. Um, so I can then do sort of like a very sort of like quick and dirty data analysis of the sites that I'm looking at. Um, so that's the digital aspect of the site. So that all of this data that I've recorded and then visualised, it's born digital, it's made within a machine, it's interpreted through a machine, it's presented on a machine. I've, you know, my hand, as it were, is quite removed from that process. But then what is the implication of that on the research? Because although it's got quite tantalising prospects, you know, you could say, I've removed myself from the process, you know, I have created this ecosystem of data that's slightly removed from the real. Um, this born digital age, it's created on a computer, um, but that has implications. You, know, you read studies, things like e-books that are written, you don't take in as much information when you read them. Um, you know, data points full of databases, they're not as easily relatable as something hard copy. But then also they're not as easily destructed. So they've got there's a couple of facets there. Um, you know, you think about you could you remove the option for human error, um, human subjectification. But that is sadly science fiction because we can't yet say that the device is perfect. The device is not subject to humans. Humans have programmed it. I built it for a start. So there is still that little element of the human creeping in there. You need to ask these kind of questions of yourself when you're building in a, a digital way of looking at the stones. Um, you know, how is the thing working? What is its limitations? Um, who is the audience? This is all, as I'm processing this data, who's going to be looking at it? What are their needs when they are looking at it? Um, what are the implications of using this on site when I'm there looking at the rocks? How is it affecting how I'm looking at them because I'm using this device? You know, how is their story speaking to me differently if I was just there looking at them with my eyes or looking at them through a bit more analog methods? And um, and if other people use it, if I release the code for my device, will they use it in the same way? Um, you know, how will that affect data? For example, if somebody wants to do the rest of Europe, I've just sort of done the northwest. If somebody wants to do more the Balkan regions, will they use it differently? Will they get the same interpretations? Um, so with these kind of questions in mind, you need to think, well, how can I supplement these digital weapons looking at rocks? Um, so I also try to do the more personal things. I get people to do things as well. So this is going back to that sheet at Drink LTP I did. I got, it was an open day for the site. It was like Heritage Open Days. And there was, I think it was about 400 people came. And I got about 100 people doing my survey, right from like young kids, two, three-year-olds, all the way up to you know, people who were like retired who came and did it. And I said to them, what's your age and gender? Because um, colour vision is affected by gender, um, or biological sex, I should say. It's usually um, male people who are colourblind because it's a fault on the X chromosome. So I wanted to know, is there a differential in the way they're seeing it? And I just generated things like um, a cloud diagram of all the words they were using. It was interesting to see that I use very sort of technical terms for the colours. I'm like, you know, deep grey, deep black, whereas they use things like orangey white and golden and bronze. And there was a lot, was obviously much more variety in the way that people who are not subjected to me just pointing a device or something and trying to be scientific about it, you know, they, they feel freer to use a lot more descriptive words. They see things different ways. And they do sort of strange things that I wouldn't have anticipated. They come back out with their sheet and they'd say, oh yeah, I used the white of the paper and I reflected light onto the stone to see what it would look like if I wasn't in the dark. Or they'd say things like, you know, oh, I used a torch on my phone to have a look at it because it wasn't too clear. And I noticed that a lot of the younger people, the kids that are under 10s, basically, they talked about the colours, but they'd also talk about the texture at the same time. They were like, oh, it's rough brown, or like, it's, it's shiny, it's shiny grey. So they, they wouldn't, it wouldn't just be pure colour to them, they would have like a more complete sensual experience when they were talking about it, uh, which I found really fascinating that mm -hmm. it was something I wouldn't have considered when I was first designing it. And obviously it's not showing in my data when I have my huge database of colours. 
but it almost seems like a much fuller experience. So that's, that's definitely something to uh, talk about later <laughs> when I uh, hopefully move on to further research. Um, so basically, both ways, the digital and this analog, they're translations of what the stone it looks like. They're translations of the colour. And so all translations are fraught with difficulty. Um, any act of translation is one of change and destruction, um, which is something that's come from a book um, by Matthew Law about uh, various networks. But when you look at something like even just something that it should be fairly simple to say, like categorise like the colour, you're translating what that original colour is into your own idea that it's coloured by your, no pun intended, by your experiences, by the way you see things, um, but also by the way you've designed your research. Um, so going back to what Katie mentioned about the Ingold paper earlier about how the materiality is something, we're so divorced from the process of creating, of the building, of the choosing of the stone, um, that we see something now, like I could go into that chamber and see a grey rock, but when in fact there's a whole process gone behind, why this grey rock, why this colour, why here? And the, why, the reason I choose Rinkelith as a case study is because there's a really handy source of rock in an outcrop in the field that's now next to it, sort of 200 yards away, that would have been perfect. You could have quarried that. It would be all uniform, perfect, beautiful. You know, same colour would have been fine. But the chamber itself is, as you saw from the picture of the colours, it's a fantastic range of stones. There's some that are covered in quartz, so it shines in the darkness. Uh, there are some that are very rough and they've chosen limestone instead, so they've obviously got that from a further source away. That then becomes porous and takes on the colour of the, of the soil that seeps down from above it, so it changes again in the colour. So to, write, to say that, you know, in the past they just chose some random rocks, that's a very disingenuous translation. Um, so what I'm arguing is that we need to become storytellers but looking at many different ways of translating that story. Um, any interpretation that we build, it's an expressionist painting because we, we're painting broad brushstrokes of these stone colours. And in order to get sort of approach why they might have been used, we need to understand the story of the stone itself, the story of the matter. We, we need to understand what roles our machines and us as archaeologists have in that story as well. And sort of how I visualise interpreting this, I know you can't see the text because the screen is very small, is putting it into assemblage, which um, I know there's been a lot of sessions about that um, here at the conference. Um, to quote one of our keynote speakers, Yanis Hamalakis, who was here earlier in the week, um, assemblage I defined as contingent co-presence of heterogeneous elements, such as bodies, things, substances, effects, memories, information, ideas. So living and non-living things in sort of a vast network that's almost like a series of Russian dolls that live within each other. So you start with the stone itself, which has its own agency, it has its own meaning, it influences other things, it's not just an inert substance. Uh, that falls within how people are viewing it and using it, and then how local myths and legends build up around it, how regional traditions affect how people look at it, and then you get sort of like further down and how it's then perceived by future generations, their ancestor reverence and then reverence for the sites that have been built before. Um, and then how that fits in with like much wider like solar seasonal celebrations about trade, about traditions within the landscape. And then right at the very outer edge of this assemblage is how we interpret it. And I mean, this is influenced by so much you know, existing interpretations, our own perceptions of the colour of the stone. It's influenced by the bias of survival. Certain sites survive, others don't. And we need to recognise that like the other layers that are going in before we can look at this outer layer and say, yeah, I'm happy with this interpretation. So the way I'm trying to sort of synthesise everything is how I look at this, this first step and I use digital and analogue means to look at that. And I'll say, well, how is the colour of that feeding into all of these other layers before I can get to this layer at the end? And I just want to recommend a couple of books that I would definitely, if you want to look at stone as this agential artefact, as a part of these networks... Um, Jane Bennett talks about political ecology. It's all about um, how things fit into networks and how how things um, shouldn't be written off as having no agency, shouldn't be written off as being inner and we control a thing. You know, we shouldn't consider the world as anthropocentric. We should look at things, um, how they affect us and how each other. And then this is the one I was talking about, the, uh, the Alan Garner and Mark Edmonds book. It's, it's, all, it's very sort of poetically written, but it's all about how objects and artefacts uh, 
imbued with their own kind of life in a way and it just sort of like changed my perspective in a lot of ways about how to look at stone um, and how to understand it as a living thing. Thank you, Gail. Thank you.